That's enough out of you. A weekly podcast where you'll hear the truth, or at least a closer version of the truth, than most of the bullshit that's out there. Here are your hosts, Bill Rader and Sean Kane. Hello and welcome to That's Enough Out of You. I'm your host, Bill Rader. And I'm Sean Kane. And you are listening to a weekly podcast where we talk about a variety of different topics. We cover a potpourri, I would say, of of different topics, a plethora. Would you say we cover a plethora, Sean? Yeah, I I like that, Bill. Yeah, we cover everything, buddy. Historical events, historical characters. And that's what we're doing for this series, this uh this series of uh, episodes is going to cover Watergate, which is one of one of the areas we've been we've been thinking about doing uh, doing these episodes for quite a while. Even you know, once, as soon as we started thinking about doing this podcast, we uh, we've been talking about doing Watergate. We we covered uh, we covered Spiro Agnew in an episode last week, but uh, Agnew was you know his his resignation. Contrary to what a lot of people think, had nothing to do with Watergate, or at least very little to do with Watergate. There was some pressure on, on the uh, prosecutors to get him to resign, but uh, for the most part, that had nothing to do with Watergate. But what we're going to talk about in this episode, and then our next episode is, is we're going to focus on Watergate. Sean, why don't you kind of give a preview of what we're going to do this uh, for this episode? Well, Bill, I mean, Watergate's such a big. Uh, issue i mean such we're gonna have a we're you know we're gonna get the most out of this we can we're gonna try to get in so much but i mean it just covers so much ground buddy it's it's like people just think about that final burglary and that's like nothing compared to the overall story yeah you know and um you know the official story bill a lot of times in history the official story is complete lie or sometimes it's just incomplete and in this case you know it's just incomplete because the official story, you know, has, you know, Nixon, this corrupt president, and, you know, he covered up this burglary. And then Woodward and Bernstein, you know, got this information from this guy, Deep Throat, who turned out to be Mark Felt. And, you know, the system worked and everybody, you know, 69 people were indicted, uh, 48 convicted. And, you know, the system worked. But that's leaving out, you know, the entire angle of the CIA. And, uh, the, you know, the blood feud that developed between Richard Helms, the director who we talked a lot about on the show, and Richard Nixon. And then it also leaves out, you know, the, the ghost of Alan Dulles, who's all over Watergate, in the shadow of David Rockefeller. And then, you know, there's so other, many other issues, you know, covert ops was running all through this. Uh, there's a military spy ring. There's the Martha, Martha Mich- Mitchell kidnapping. You know, the John Paisley murder, uh, mystery to that. The E. Howard Hunt's wife dies in a plane crash. Uh, Jagger Hoover dies in the middle of this, and his files end up with James Angleton, who, who's a name we talked about a lot on the show. You have the, the Nixon tapes with the 18 missing minutes. What's on those tapes? You know, you have the whole deep, deep troll character. You have the whole Anna Chenault affair where, you know, Nixon basically sabotages the, the Vietnam peace talks. And then, you know, of course, we know what he did later on, bombing Laos and Cambodia and expanding the war, you know. And then, of course, it wouldn't be us unless we, you know, tie the Watergate to the the Kennedy assassination, you know. So, I mean, it's like there's so much to cover, buddy. And that official story is incomplete. Go ahead, Billy. No, you you mentioned, I mean, you just talked about a lot of stuff right there and you mentioned a lot of names and we'll. We'll explain all that stuff along the way here. I know there's, you know, there. I'm sure we have listeners who aren't as uh, aren't as familiar with this whole story, and so we, you know, we want to make sure we're not just throwing out last names and we're not just throwing out events and stuff. We want to try to explain everything, and um, and we will. So, so we'll uh, we'll get started here. We'll 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 start uh, we'll start talking about. Uh, I think this is we're going to start pre Watergate, right, John? Or pre? I should say pre uh break in um oh yeah we're, f- we're gonna start from the beginning bill from when this right. whole thing started buddy and you know we're probably gonna end up uh having more questions than we answer at the end that's just the way watergate is it's just there's yeah. so much to it buddy but we'll do our best all right well let's get started 
Okay, so what you basically had was you have uh, Richard Nixon set up what he called the plumber's unit, okay? And they got their name, the plumber's unit, because they were there to plug leaks, because a lot of stuff was going on. Leaks were coming out from the White House about the Vietnam War, and that was from Daniel Ellsberg. And uh, I know Tom Hanks don't think Ellsberg is, a, you know, important character enough to put him in his movie for more than 10 minutes. But right. Ellsberg, you know, released the Pentagon Papers, which told a lot about the atrocities going on in Vietnam in the war. And uh, Nixon set this up to, to plug the leaks. So initially, you know, they wanted to discredit Daniel Ellsberg. And also... Nixon wanted to go after a lot of his enemies, including Ted Kennedy and any, anybody else named Kennedy, to be honest with you. And it was initially persuaded, Bill, by Henry Kissinger and Charles Colson. And the chief of the plumbers unit was a man by the name of David Young. Now, David Young was mentored by Nelson Rockefeller, who's David Rockefeller's uh, brother, who would end up being vice president when this whole thing is done, uh, with Gerald Ford being the president. So. Right. Right there, you see, Bill, the, the, you know, the shadow of Rockefeller is already on this thing right from the beginning. But uh, Charles Colson was a classmate of E. Howard Hunt. So, you know, he basically brings Hunt into the fold and uh, Hunt kind of manipulated his way on there, you know. And E. Howard Hunt, Bill, is like the James Bond of, of the CIA, yeah. You know, his name comes up. I mean, every conspiracy theory from aliens to the Kennedy assassination to to MK Ultra to everything. And, you know, Hunt was down there in New Orleans with with uh, Lee Harvey Oswald down there at Guy Bannister's uh, right. office down there. And his name also comes up in a in a cold operation, CIA operation called QK Enchant. And another operative uh, was in that with Hunt, was which was Clay Shaw. Who we know we talked about on previous episodes was, you know, um, brought to trial by Jim Garrison for for the murder of Kennedy. Right. So when the when the plumbers are set up, Bill, and, and the interesting thing about it is, a year before the plumbers were set up, Hunt went to Miami to meet with some of the Cubans who would later be on the burglary team, who were all CIA assets. They're, they were anti-Castro Cubans, and it was kind of a call to action meeting. And now this is an, uh, a year, almost a year before the plumbers unit is, is even set up. So you see right there, you think that, you know, Helms might already be manipulating this thing, you know, from the shadows. And um, the first thing the plumbers did is uh, E. Howard Hunt and, and Charles Colson met with a CIA operative by the name of Lucien Conin. Okay. And what they were trying to do is get up, uh, get this information that JFK approved the assassination of Diem in, uh, in Vietnam. Now, Bill, at this point, Kennedy's been dead for over a decade. Right. Here they are. The first thing they're doing is getting up, you know, getting this information. Now, did that come from Nixon or did that come from Helms? It's like, where's the direction of this thing going? You know, like, who's really calling the shots here? And it's, it's, I don't have an answer who really was calling the shots at that point. Um, Sean, let's, let's set up if we can a little bit about, the, about Nixon and, and his his presidency, because, you know, we kind of I don't want to skip over that. I want to make sure that we can. So, I mean, Nixon, Nixon ran against Kennedy in 1960. Right. That was right. He, he ran for president against against uh, JFK in 1960. And that was one of the first sort of televised races for president. And, and a lot of people believe that, um, you know, Nixon's appearance in the debate against Kennedy is probably what cost him the election because he appeared to be sweating profusely. He was very, very uncomfortable. And, you know, he, he desperately wanted to be president. Well, that's not true, Bill. And the thing is, you know, it goes back to that 1960 election. This is when all the disinformation started to come out about Joe Kennedy being involved with the mafia. And that was all from Nixon's camp. Right. Oh, right there. You see the, you know, the, the shenanigans and the tactics, the dirty tricks that, that yeah. Nixon's using. Right. Yep. Yeah. And then, you know, again, uh, as, as the, the, the Vietnam war progressed and, and, uh, you know, again, and Johnson became less and less popular, Nixon really took advantage of that. And, you know, we talked about 
his his running mate, him, you know, getting the getting the nomination, who he was going to select as his running mate. Obviously, he picked Agnew, but you know, he had some other folks that he was he was looking at. Ronald Reagan was one of them, and um, but then you know, of course, one one and won fairly easily in 68. Um, and the, you know, what we're getting into the, um, you know, the whole Watergate uh, burglary, the whole Watergate investigation, all of that stemmed from the 72 race, the 72 election, which they won by a landslide, Nixon and, and Agnew uh, won by a landslide. So I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Sean, but I, you know, I just kind of wanted to set the stage for some of the some of the uh, the big. No, that's good, Bill, and I think it does set. You know, it sets up the the paranoia that was created by Nixon, that that would go on throughout his entire you know uh, presidency. Right. You know, and this this is the you'll you'll find out, Bill, that you know trust kills faster than bullets in this thing because everybody is backstabbing everybody, and it, it's just an absolute mess. But it, it really is created by Nixon's paranoia. So let's get back to the to the plumbers, Bill. So. Three months after the plumbers unit is formed, uh, Jim McCord signs on as uh, security director of CREEP, which is a great acronym for the the committee to reelect uh, Richard Nixon. You know, yeah, yeah. And Jim McCord, Bill. Jim McCord was twenty year veteran of the CIA, and when these guys they say ex CIA this and that, like it's not a country club, Bill. It's like right. when they say ex mafia, it's not a country club where they, they join for the month. And then at the end of the month, they're done. You know what I mean? Their dues, yeah. they got paid their dues. I mean, McCord and Hunt were still CIA and they were still reporting to uh, Richard Helms, who was the director. So the other members, Bill, that, that were involved in this are all CIA guys. Um, Eugenio Martinez was one of the Cubans. Uh, he was a CIA contract agent involved in the Bay of Pigs. You have Bernard Barker, who was a, a CIA uh, anti-Castro Cuban, and he was like a finance guy, Bill. He would set up dummy accounts for the agency to use. He was also a safe cracker, you know, and he a lock, he picking locks. It was an expert at that, so he would be useful on burglaries. And um, Frank Sturgis was another one whose name comes up in almost every conspiracy there is, but... He was a contract agent of the agency, and he was part of something called the Interpin, which is like they were a mercenary group, Bill. And then you had uh, Virginia Gonzalez, who was uh, another Cuban, uh, anti-Castro Cuban, who his name comes up in the Chicago plot to assassinate Kennedy. So all these guys, Bill, were veterans of the CIA. The only one that wasn't was G. Gordon Liddy. G. Gordon mm -hmm. Liddy was FBI. You know, he... He had intelligence background, but it was domestic intelligence, you know, from the FBI. And I think Liddy was the guy that was most loyal to Nixon, where Hunt and McCord are loyal to Richard Helms. So now, Bill, what I want to do now is I want to kind of get into all the shenanigans that was going on way before that last burglary where everybody got caught, because there was so much going on, like the... There were six, I believe, six burglaries, Bill, that were successful before that that one where they got caught, including a successful burglary at the Watergate office building. You know, there was already a successful burglary at that. But one of them was uh, they broke into the psychiatrist of uh, Daniel Wellsberg. They broke into his office. And again, this is, you know, Nixon wanted to discredit everything coming from Ellsberg about the Pentagon Papers. So they stole files. They they photocopied the important files, and, and they want to know why was Ellsberg seeing a psychiatrist. And, um, you know, they wanted to discredit him. So they would put out a campaign, uh, uh, you know, of disinformation, feed it to the media. And also they had uh, Ellsberg under surveillance. And then... You also had, Bill, a lot of covert operations going on at this time. You had Operation Chaos, which was a CIA operation, basically to discredit the left, any any group that really veered to the left. And then you had uh, FBI investigation or an FBI operation called COINTELPRO, which was uh, FBI. It's the same thing as chaos, but it was coming from the FBI to discredit left-wing groups, you know, like 
for example, one of them was a uh, women's right to vote group, you know? So there you have Jagger Hoover protecting yep. the world from, you know, me, me and your grandma from being able to vote. Right. Yep. You know, but they, the, some of the operations they had built, they were bugging offices of political opponents. They were ordering investigations, activities, of political groups, and using the FBI, the CIA, the IRS as political weapons, you know? And it goes back to G. Gordon Liddy, uh, when he was finance counsel for, for Creep. Um, he has a meeting. So he presents this plan. And at the meeting was Jeb Magruder, who was the Creep acting chairman, uh, the attorney general at the time, which is John Mitchell, and the president's counsel at the time, which is John Dean. And Liddy presents his plan uh, involving the plumbers and what he wanted to do was extensive legal activities against a bunch of Democrats, you know, and it was really an outrageous plan that even Mitchell said is kind of unrealistic. So he wanted to have a watered down. So then two months later, Liddy comes up with a watered down plan and they reduce it. And, uh, you know, Mitchell approves it. Now this included burglaries, this included installing listening devices. This is all illegal activity, Bill. You know, they're, they're not getting subpoenas to, to wiretap people. I mean, they're breaking into buildings. I mean, this is all illegal activity being conducted by the plumbers, you know, which was created by Richard Nixon. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, we talked about um, all of this, these covert operations and, and you know, disinformation I mean, some of it was also aimed, like you said, at, at Nixon's political opponents. I mean, they were really trying to narrow down. They were trying to get the the opponent they wanted for the 72 election. They, they wanted McGovern. They wanted to run against McGovern, and they were trying to discredit guys like at um Edmund Muskie. Right. So they 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 did a lot of. Um... Well, let's talk about Muskie for a minute, Bill. All right. Because. um you know, he was uh, Secretary of State under Carter, and then he was a senator from Maine, um, and he was the 1968 vice president candidate with Humphrey. And he was born to Polish immigrants, Bill. And um, he ran in 72 for president, and Nixon's dirty tricks absolutely destroyed him. And what, what it was, Bill, was something called the Canuck letter, which was a forged letter to the press, right, that... Uh, said that Muskie held prejudice against Americans of French Canadian descent. Right. And this was the work of one of Nixon's hatchet men by the name of Donald Segretti. And Segretti bill was involved in so many dirty tricks for Nixon. In fact, if he wasn't, if he wasn't as, as young as he was at the time, I would have think he would have been the hatchet man on the, the Kennedy 60 election when they, they came out without this information about old man Kennedy, but Segretti was too young. He was still at school going to uh, USC, which I find kind of mm. ironic being an Notre Dame fan that, <laughs> you know, USC would produce a guy like Segretti. But, uh, I mean, there's just the thing they did to Muskie, Bill. They absolutely ruined him. And this wasn't the only thing Segretti did. I mean, he had he fake letters accusing Senator uh, Henry Scoop Jackson of having an illegitimate child with, a, with an underage girl, uh, 16, 17-year-old girl. And that wasn't true, Bill. Mm. So imagine the damage that accusations like that do. And, and then he also acu accused Humphrey of sec sexual misconduct. And none of that was true, Bill. Yeah. So, you know, Singretti's dirty tricks was just unbelievable. And he was Nixon's hatchet man. But the, the important thing, Bill, is that while, while Nixon is directing his traffic with guys like Singretti, Hunt and McCord at the same time are, are feeding Richard Helms at the CIA information on not just the Democrats, but on Republicans and on White House staff members on their sexual history bill. You know, and this is just the nonsense that was going on. Like there's so much mistrust going on in this, this White House. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, and, and again, when you think about, remember the interview we had with Lisa Peace and she talked about James Angleton um, getting the, blackmail material on J. Edgar Hoover and using it against them, you know, this is where, you know, when it goes, when, when Hunt and McCord are feeding this to Richard Helms, 
you could be sure that, you know, his main guy, James Angleton, the chief of counterintelligence is involved in this as well. You know, I think we did a pretty good job setting the stage here so far, Sean. Well, there's even more stuff, Bill, because what was going on was there was something called the, the more Rafford affair that went on during this, this whole thing, Bill. And what that was, was during the Watergate hearings, it came out that, that uh, David Young, who we talked about as the chief of the plumbers and, and the rest of the plumbers were investigating a military spy ring. Okay. In the Senate, um, the Senate convened secret hearings on this bill under the committee of the armed services. And this is what became known as the Moore Rafford affair. And Rafford was an aide to Admiral Moore, chairman of the joint chief of staff. And Rafford testified Okay, that Henry Kissinger's foreign policy was catastrophic by design, and the military spying activities were were in, were to combat a conspiracy conceived by the Rockefellers and the Council on Foreign Relations, and it was impl- implemented by Henry Kissinger. And the whole purpose of this was to win the Soviets' um, cooperation and guaranteeing that the Rockefellers continued domination over world currency to create a one world government or what they like to say, a new world order. Now, I don't know how much of that, you know, is really true, Bill, but the one thing that is true is that the plumbers were spying on the military, the military spying on the white house, on Nixon Kissinger and Rockefeller. And you have some of the plumbers McCord and Hunt are spying on the white house and giving information back to Helms. So you see where all this is going? Like, it's just a mess. It's just, it's just like batshit crazy. All this stuff that's going on. Yeah. And then another thing I want to talk about, Bill, because you talked about, you talked about the election. You talked about um, going back to Humphrey, but what happened is um, Anna Chenault, Bill was, she was a member of the U.S. China lobby. Okay, and she was married to a, a general, um, Claire Chenault, who was the commander of the Flying Tigers. Okay, and um, she was the vice president of Flying Tiger Lines, which is a cargo airline that transported uh, U.S. troops into Vietnam. Now she was really close to most of the Asian governments. Okay, she was born in China, but she had close ties to both sides of Vietnam. She had ties in Korea, uh, ties in Japan. And what she did on the, at Nixon's direction, Bill, is she sabotaged the, sabotaged the peace talks because at the end there, Johnson realized that, you know, his legacy was going to be Vietnam and he wanted to get out. Right. So what he did is he was actually trying to negotiate peace between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. And Nixon made sure that Anna Chanel sabotaged those attacks till after he was elected and there would be no peace in Vietnam. Now you think about, you know, we talked about he ends up expanding the war to Laos and Cambodia. Mm -hmm. You know, so here he is, you know, who knows if that would have happened, Bill, if there would have been peace and they would have ended the war in 68. Yeah. But he sabotaged the the, the peace talks. And there's a great phone call between Johnson and Nixon where Johnson has the information. He knows, he knows what Richard Nixon did. And he's kind of subtly calling him out saying, Hey, this Anna Chenault is going, you know, saying this, trying to sabotage the talks. And she's saying that it was under your direction and this and that. And and Nixon's like, I would never do that. And and Johnson, you know, he's he's probably laughing under his breath, you know, because he's basically calling him out. He knows what Nixon right. did. Yeah. You know, so you start to see Bill all the dirty tactics. Well, at this point, Bill, you could see you could see what's going on. You can see that that Helms is using the plumbers to do covert ops, you know. Like one thing I didn't mention was Operation Sapphire, Bill, which was, you know. Um, an operation to entrap uh, Democrats with prostitutes, you know, and this was actually, it was initially proposed by Liddy, 
but Hunt and McCord were doing it, and they were they were doing this not just for Democrats, Bill. They were trying to trap uh, Republicans. So you see, there's like no loyalty to anybody here. Like everybody's a target, and there's just all kind of craziness going on. Yeah, you know. Okay, so now where I want to go right now, Bill, is let's go to that final burglary mm -hmm. that everybody thinks is the only key thing in Watergate. So we already talked about successful burglaries that they had, including the Watergate Hotel. Now, the reason they went back in another time, this final time, is really unclear. I, I think you get different stories from different people. You know, they were saying the bugs didn't work originally. And there's always been a question, Bill, of why were they bugging, you know, O'Brien, the Democratic National Chairman's office, when he didn't even use that office that much at this point. He was using the offices down in Florida. But the reason is they wanted to go back in, is what they said, is because the bugs that they planted originally weren't working. But right. You get other stories from different people. And one interesting thing, Bill, we go sideways for a second. The Federal Reserve had an office in that building on the seventh floor. So every time we mention the Federal Reserve, my spidey senses uh, come out. And I, I think about Rockefeller, you know, yeah. and there's an interesting story. One of the Cubans talked about how McCord went up to that floor and was really friendly with one of the security guards on that floor. And um, that might have nothing to do with anything, but just that he was going up to a floor where the Federal Reserve had an office is kind of suspicious to me. But, you know, I haven't really found anything beyond that. But let's get to that final burglary. So what you had is you had a guy by the name of Alfred Baldwin, who was ex-FBI, and he was the lookout man. And he was on, he was in the Howard Johnson across the street. And you had McCord, Frank Sturgis, and the Cubans, uh, the Cuban exiles. They all went in. And what they did is, Bill, when they broke in, they left tape on the door. Okay. Now that's a that's a rookie mistake made by guys that are all serious black operators. I mean, all these guys are seasoned CIA veterans. To make now, a mistake like that. When you say they left tape on the door, they they taped over the the lock, Bill. You know, right. like the the inside of the lock. Right. So it wouldn't close. Right. But, right. So that mean that meant that they must have had somebody on the inside to do that. No, after they picked the lock, Bill. They oh, picked I the lock, and so then, then they put the tape on it. But they left the tape, like when they were done with one office or whatever, they would leave it. Instead oh, okay. of taking the tape off, they left it. That's a rookie okay. mistake. Okay. The other mistake they made is uh, McCord instructed all the 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 burglars to turn off their, their walkie-talkies because he said he was picking up static, but nobody else was picking up static. So they shut off their walkie-talkies. Now, Baldwin's across the street, and what happens is he's watching TV, waiting to, you know, just keep an eye on – on the Watergate office building and the security guard inside Frank Willis, you know, ends up seeing the tape. So he calls the police. So uh, plain clothes uh, uh, detectives come to the office and Baldwin sees them. Now, if they're in plain clothes, you know, he's probably assuming they're cops, but he's not sure he's, he's on the walkie talkie saying somebody's coming aboard right. aboard. Yeah. But nobody hears them. Because McCord told everybody to shut the walkie-talkies off. So mm -hmm. the guys get caught. Now, this is where the, the theory is that McCord and Hunt on Richard Helms' orders sabotage um, that burglary on purpose. And the thing is, Bill, when these guys, I've, I've studied these CIA guys for years, when they make mistakes, it's usually on purpose. You know, and the, and the thing is, this is where the blood feud with Nixon and Helms goes on, because remember, Nixon has his own agenda with the plumbers, but Helms has his his own agenda as well. So the burglars get caught. And then one of the Cubans had his hotel uh, key card on him and in, in his room, he had a had a book, a notebook. And on there, it had a phone number, and it said HH slash WH, which was Howard Hunt, the White House. So when they called that number, 
Howard Hunt answered and his office was in the White House. So now mm -hmm. you've connected this whole thing to the White House. Right. And this is where the cover up comes in. OK, in the whole time this cover up's going on, Nixon's recording all this. So you have this unbelievable recordings of Nixon basically, you know, um, trying to sabotage the investigation. Well, this is so let's get back to let's set up the, the recording real quick, because this is another example of Nixon being paranoid, not trusting anybody. He set up secret recording devices. Sure. In the White House and, you know, in the Oval Office and, and in other rooms in the White House. <laughs> However, he he certainly didn't, uh, you know, his intention wasn't for it to to uh, to be used against him. But that's no. that's what ended up happening. But it goes to his paranoia, Bill. He doesn't right. trust anybody. And I, you can see why, because, I mean, everybody's backstabbing everybody in this scenario. So the interesting thing about the recordings, Bill, there's two things I want to talk about now. There's the 18 missing minutes that's on those recordings, okay? Uh, but before right. we get to that, there's a, a really interesting comment um, by H.R. Uh, Haldeman. And Haldeman said, because one of the recordings, it's a conversation between Nixon and Haldeman. And Nixon's trying to get Richard Helms at the CIA to squash the FBI investigation into Watergate. And he's telling him, you got to tell Helms, he's got to get on the FBI and tell them to end this investigation. Now, now, Bill, that's obstruction of justice. There's no, I right. mean, it's clear as day. Yep. Okay. And what happens is Helms is telling him he doesn't want to get involved. He doesn't want to, you know, and Nixon says to Haldeman, you tell him that what I'm really worried about is that this whole Bay of Pigs thing is going to blow up in, in Helms' face. Now, think about that comment, Bill. The Bay of Pigs, what, what does that even mean? Like, what does that have to do with any of this stuff? The Bay of Pigs was uh, years ago. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what happened on the Bay of Pigs. You know, it doesn't have any relevance to this. But in, in Haldeman's memoirs, he said that when Nixon used the phrase Bay of Pigs, talking with Richard Helms, it was a cold word they had for the Kennedy assassination. Okay. Now, everybody said, oh, you know, that there's no context for that. This is just Haldeman, you know, making stuff up and right. conspiracy theorists again, this and that. Um, but we now know from declassified documents, Bill, that there's context for this. Because when Richard Nixon first became president, okay, Haldeman says to him, for some reason, and I don't know why he said this to him, but he said, we need to reopen the Kennedy assassination investigation. And Nixon said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. But what I want you to do is I want you to get Ehrlichman and go over to Dick Helms at the CIA and ask him for everything he has on the Bay of Pigs and Cuban operations, okay? Now, Nixon knows a lot about that because Nixon was vice president for Eisenhower when a lot of these activities started, including something called Operation 40, which was a, an operation used by the CIA and anti-Castro Cubans to, to go after Fidel Castro. So Nixon is, is really, you know, he knows a lot about these, these operations. So he sends Ehrlichman over there and he keeps going to Helms and Helms gives him the, the CIA usual story. Listen, Plausible deniability. Tell the president it's for his own good. I can't show him what's in these files. It's there to protect him. And he comes back empty like four times, Bill. Finally, Haldeman says to Nixon, he's like, Mr. President, Helms is not going to give this up. You're going to have to see him yourself. So Nixon calls Helms into the White House, okay? And Helms comes in and he says, you know, what's this about? We've always been friendly. Like, what are you uh, trying to start some witch hunt? And Nixon's like, no, 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 no. He said, everything you guys were doing in, in Cuba and everything, I back it up 100%. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll back these up if you get in any trouble. Basically saying I'll lie for you, whatever you want to do. He said, mm -hmm. you guys were right at the Bay of Pigs. Kennedy screwed it up. He said, he said, well, Helms is like, well, what do you want, Mr. President? He's like, this is what I want. I want everything on the who shot John angle. Now. He's not talking about John Doe down the street, Bill. He's talking about Kennedy. Right. Yeah, of course. So 
we now know that there is context for that. So any time after that, when he said Bay of Pigs, he would be referring to the Kennedy assassination. So now forward to this whole Watergate blows up and Nixon is trying to get Helms to say, to, to end this investigation, to get on the FBI and end this investigation. When he, when Helms refuses, he basically says to him, look, he says, if you don't do this, the whole Kennedy assassination thing is going to blow up in your face because Nixon realizes, even though he has no information about what exactly happened, he knows that as uh, reporter Jefferson Morley said, the, he knew that Helms and the CIA were very vulnerable, Bill, on the question of who killed Kennedy. So when Nixon says that, that's a very nasty threat to Richard Helms. Right. And that's where the blood feud, and that's where people think that, you know, the blood feud between Nixon and Helms got so bad because, again, they have separate agendas. You know, Helms is running operations with the plumbers, and Nixon's running operations, and it's all legal activity. So that, that's a very nasty threat. And this is where, you know, Jim McCord would later say that if Nixon gets rid of Helms, Every tree in the forest is going to fall, which eventually that's what happened, you know, but um, the, the feud just got so bad between Nixon. Nixon did end up getting rid of Helms, but it's like all these guys, Bill, like when Dulles got fired, Helms ends up being ambassador to Iran and he's running all kind of operations over there. So it's like these guys are they're like uh, text, Bill. You can't get them out. Like you right. try to fire them. They never get fired. It's like when Lisa talked about William Harvey. And Kennedy wanted to fired and they end up sending him to Rome where he makes friends with the mafia over there, you know? So it's like, it's hard to get rid of these guys. But uh, so basically next bill is on the recordings. We know there's, there's a famous 18 or infamous 18 missing minutes. And the thing is they already had what's called the smoking gun on this, that Nixon uh, obstructing justice, trying to end the, these investigations so that's already a very bad thing. What was on those 18 minutes that he deleted that could have been worse than that, Bill? I that's that's a great question, Sean. I mean, you know, and and I think we we need to take a step back too and just because the tapes were were a huge subject of um you know, they they were going back and forth on on those tapes for a long time because there was a there was a special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, who, who was assigned to investigate Watergate. And when he found out about the tapes, he insisted that Nixon hand them over. You know, this was uh, I, I and Sean, I forget how it was leaked that these tapes existed. But uh, what you know, when they did find out about it, and I'm not sure if you know if you have the information. Well, a, a better question, Bill, is why didn't Nixon... Uh, delete these tapes. Why did he wow. keep the tapes? Yeah, he he kept. I mean, them. he had a chance while all this was going on, and they're trying to get the tapes. They're trying to get it. Why did he, um, not to just delete them? Right. That's and that's access all question. of them. That's but the to, to answer your question, but I I believe I believe Woodward uh, might have got that information about the the recordings. He found out about India. I, I believe so. Yeah, a lot Ooh. of the information. Through you know, Deep Throat or, or yeah, just... Yeah, well, see, that's another game. thing, Bill. The, the Deep Throat character, uh, which later would come out to be Mark Felt, right. like, I, there's a lot of theories on that, that I think a lot of the information that Woodward was getting couldn't all came from Mark Felt. Like, Felt was assistant director of the FBI, and there was so much information on a lot of these other activities that was going on that, you know, Felt really wouldn't have access to. So... A lot of people looked into Woodward had a background in Navy intelligence and he may have been getting sources. Now, I'm not saying Woodward was involved in, in setting anybody up or anything like that, but he could have possibly been manipulated to the information getting to Woodward could have been manipulated by Helms, you know, and he could have been getting information from the sources from Helms and it could have been good information too, because remember Helms at this point, Helms and Nixon are, are in a blood feud. So I just think that a lot of the information, I, I think the whole thing about Deep Throat, I think Woodward was getting information from other sources besides Mark Felt. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Well, they, I mean, Woodward and, and Bernstein were doing a lot of door to door um investigating they were knocking on it. anybody who had anything to do with the um the committee to reelect the president um anybody that would talk to them they were you know they were on the phone they were like i said going door to door they were trying to get all of the information that they could and you know some of the some of the stuff that you see like if, if you've ever seen the movie um all the president's men great movie oh fantastic and you know they just it really showed what they were doing, the the just the you know relentless um, interviewing and and just like I said, going door to door and talking to anybody who would talk to them, and doing whatever they could to get people on the record. Most people connected to this wouldn't go on the record, and uh, you know, well, would, Bill, here's a question I have for you. Uh, you know, why why did did uh, Woodward ha- Woodward had to get information? about Helms's involvement in this, right? Like, why did that total, that entire CIA go, why was that left out by Woodward? Like, everything with Hunt and McCord and, and all this stuff that they were doing for Helms, why was that totally left out of the the entire Watergate story? I don't know. I couldn't answer that. No, I mean, it's just, <laughs> but that's an important question, Bill. Yeah, uh, I don't, maybe, I don't know. Maybe he didn't know. Maybe he didn't find that information out. I, I don't know. Well, I don't know. He's a pretty good investigator, Bill. I think he, you know, I just think he, he, you know, he wanted to go down one avenue and didn't want to go down the other avenue. Maybe. You know, I mean, as as dirty, you know, as as the dirty tricks and everything, and as as corrupt as Nixon was, Helms is a whole different level, Bill. Right. Because you know, Helms will get you killed. Well, I don't mean, for, don't also don't forget, Sean. Woodward and Bernstein, I mean, there was a, you know, the year or so prior to, you know, the, the, a lot of the events of 1973, when, you know, there was a, a, like I said, the special prosecutor, they were chasing their tails for a while. And a lot of people said that there's nothing to this. They're they're you know, Watergate is, is, is there's nothing going on um, that this is a, you know, it's a hoax. It's all, you know, all political, uh, uh, um, they're just going after Nixon. The Democrats. And they were young guys too, but that, but and, and you know they they were almost uh, fired a, a couple of times by the Washington Post because they they just kept on pursuing the story when it seemed like there wasn't a story. This didn't it didn't you know it wasn't always it wasn't from the beginning that there was this you know everybody assumed that Nixon was a crook and was doing all of these terrible things. It took a long time to prove that it took a long time. And, and like I said, a lot of people flipping and a lot of people giving, giving uh, information and leaking information for them to finally get to the point where people were starting to take it seriously. And that what really wasn't, it really didn't happen until, you know, 73, almost uh, right you know, mid 73. So like I said, there was a, so I think he was just basically saying, listen, whatever's going to get me the story, that's what I'm going to go with. Whatever, you know, I, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to hedge my bets. I'm just going to go with what I have and uh, you know, and, and get, get the most, um, you know, bang for my buck, so to speak. And and that's what he did. And, and, you know, the two of them. Well, to your point, Bill, like, OK, so it, it's 73 is when this whole thing blows over. And that's at the point where Helms, the feud between Helms and Nixon is so bad. Did Helms say, you know, did Helms leak a lot of this information? And basically, instead of taking out like they did, like he did with Kennedy, taking him out with a bullet, you know, take Nixon out another way by by you know, assassinating his character, not saying Nixon's innocent, not saying he's innocent, right. but, you know, taking the one thing from Richard Nixon that's more important than maybe his own life, which was his legacy, because now Nixon's, you know, he's known as a crook. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and the thing that bothers me, Bill, the thing that bothers me is 69 people were indicted, 40, 48 were convicted. And if you look at their sentences, I mean, none of them are even served even close to what they were they were uh, supposed to. Like uh, E. Howard Hunt was convicted for 35 years; he was supposed to serve, and he ended up serving like 33 months. Bill, 
Mm-hmm. And that's another thing on the tapes where Hunt is asking, he's blackmailing the White House and he's basically telling them, you know, I want hush money and everything. And, and Nixon basically is saying, pay him, you know, we right. can't let this guy talk. Right. And, and that's that's on the tapes. And of course, Howard Hunt's uh, wife dies in a plane crash, you know, right in the middle of this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much stuff, Sean. And, and you know, my, my, I, we could go on and on and on here. I think maybe, you know, let's let's uh, we'll stop here. And then because, you know, we still have to get to we still have to get to the Saturday Night Massacre. Um, we still have to get to, you know, the all of the, uh, you know, the hearings and, and all the stuff that, that was going on. Um, you know, there were there was a lot of legal battles going on with uh, Nixon saying that the tapes, you know, uh, that he had executive privilege and, and the tapes should not be released. Um, and then, you know, of course, all of the, the final in- investigations and everything which led to his resignation. And um, so there's a lot of stuff left to, to cover. I think maybe we need to stop here and then, and then we'll pick it up in, uh, in part two. Okay. All right. Oh, I, yeah, I mean, it's so, just, you so know, much, the, the so thing much. is build a paranoia and the, the dirty tricks that was going on, you know, by, by everybody involved. I mean, it, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what makes this one of the one of the craziest stories ever. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. The tactics that, that are being used here. I mean, it's just, you know, nobody trusts anybody. Right. I mean, everybody's spying on everybody. Everybody's bugging everybody. And, and oh, my God, it's unbelievable. Amazing. All right, Sean. I mean, we covered a lot of ground here. We talked about a lot of things and, you know, we'll come back next week and uh we'll we'll wrap this up we'll wrap up watergate and talk about you know all the the aftermath and everything like that just so so much to talk about with this uh, but thank you sean you did did a great job a lot of a lot of good work uh, went into this episode so thank you yeah there's a lot to cover bill and it's hard to you know put everything in order because you know stuff is coming out recently you know that that sheds light on it and for yeah. every every answer you get on a question it, it opens up 10 room questions Absolutely. it's just crazy yeah all right well you guys want to make sure that you subscribe on on youtube and you'll be able to get notification for future episodes make sure you follow us make sure you are following us on your podcast apps and uh you know we're on youtube or we're on uh we're on facebook we're on instagram and twitter so find us on on those uh, social media sites and Drop us a line. You could even send us uh, send us an email at uh, that's enough out of you show at gmail.com. We're always happy to hear your comments and we'll probably end up reading them uh, on the show too. All right, buddy. All right, Sean. Thank you, this, man. This was a draining episode, buddy. <laughs> it was a good episode, though. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's enough out of you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>